Marie-Madeleine Marguerite d'Aubray, later known as the Marquise de Brinvilliers, was a French aristocrat who was accused and convicted of murdering her father and two of her brothers in order to inherit their estates. Her alleged crimes were discovered after the death of her lover and co-conspirator, Captain Godet de Saint-Croix, who saved letters detailing dealings of poisonings between the two. After being arrested, she was tortured, forced to confess, and finally executed. In her confession, the Marquise acknowledged being sexually assaulted at the age of seven, though she did not name her assaulter. Further admitted in her confession is that she also had sexual relations with her younger brother, Antoine, whom she would later poison. After her death, there was speculation that she poisoned upwards of 30 sick people in hospitals to test out her poisons, but these rumors were never confirmed. Her trial and death spawned the onset of the affair of the poisons, a major scandal that accused aristocrats of practicing witchcraft and poisoning people. Let's get into the life, crimes, and eventual execution of the Marquise de Brinvilliers. Welcome, my loves, to Poisonous Affairs. I'll be discussing the sordid details of some of the most talked-about scandals that rocked the 17th century French and English courts. It's all about lust, power, greed, and murder. <laughs> There's so much that happens in this story, so come close, my darlings, and let me give you the tea about the Marquise. I'm setting the stage, and we open with, The Marquise was born, oh my, in 1630, to the relatively wealthy and influential household of Daubray. Her father, Antoine Drew Daubray, had multiple important governmental and high-ranking positions. Her mother was the sister of Jean-Jacques Goulier, who founded the Sulpicians and established the settlement of Ville-Marie in New France, which would later be called Montréal, or as some English speakers say, Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> so before I continue, I was actually looking up how to say these names, right? Because I'm just like, oh my goodness, they're so difficult. And they're a bit of tongue twisters. Even though I speak French, it doesn't mean I don't F up. <laughs> <laughs> in pronunciation, right? But one of them was, I wanted to look up to make sure I was saying her father's name, Antoine Drew Daubré, correctly, right? And so I looked it up and I found a place where they had it, um, how they pronounced it. And I swear to God, <laughs> the pronunciation came from like some American or something because the way they said it was Antoine Drew Daubré. <laughs> I was clutching my non-existent pearls. Okay, you know what? I was clutching my clavicle at this point. And I was like, oh, is that what people hear when I speak French? Because my mom, my uncle, and certain other like people in my family on the French-speaking side, like they always say, you, you sound Canadian when you speak French. And I'm like, or my mom would say to me, are you speaking Canadian French to me? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I am mortified if that's what people hear when I speak French. Oh my goodness. All right, back to the story. Though the eldest of five children and loved by her father, she would not inherit his estate and was thus expected to marry into another. Coming from a family of such wealth, whomever she married would inherit quite a large dowry from her, 200,000 livres to be exact. At the age of 21, in 1651, she was married to Antoine Gobelin, Baron de Nourard, and Chevalier in the Order of Saint-Jean of Jerusalem, and later the Marquis de Brinvilliers, whose estate was worth 800,000 livres. His wealth came from his ancestors' famed tapestry workshops. His father was the president of the Chamber of Accounts. Their marriage was considered an auspicious one. Upon marriage, the Marquise's father bestowed upon the couple a house at 12 Rue Neuve Saint Paul in Marais, an aristocratic district of Paris. She soon had three children, two girls and a boy. She had a total of seven children, 
of which at least four are suspected of being illegitimate children from the Marquise's various paramours. Oh, my... In 1659, the Marquise introduced his wife to one of his gambling buddies, Godet de Saint-Croix, also known as the Chevalier de Saint-Croix. Now, Saint-Croix had no notable pedigree. In fact, all he had to his name were debts and a bad reputation. However, he was handsome and talented. I'm not too sure in which way he was talented. Was it with his hands, his tongue, or being an unscrupulous character? <laughs> Either way, Marie Madeleine fell for him and the pair became lovers. This affair did not bother Antoine, her husband, as it left him free to pursue his own. The couple's fortune rapidly began to disappear through gambling and extravagance, and the Marquis fled France to avoid his debtors, which meant that Marie Madeleine was left behind to carry on an unchecked affair with Saint-Croix. The scandal of Marie Madeleine may not have bothered her husband, but her father was displeased to hear of his daughter's sexual affair with Saint Croix, and was further displeased that his daughter was in the process of separating her wealth from her husband's, which was akin to almost divorcing him, a major faux pas in French aristocratic society. Due to her father's position as a prévôt, granting him a large amount of power and influence, in 1663 he instigated a lettre de cachet, or an order of arrest, against her lover, Saint-Croix. While riding in a carriage with the Marquise, Saint-Croix was arrested in front of her and thrown into the Bastille for a little under two months. The Marquise later commented that perhaps if her father had not had her lover arrested, she might have never poisoned him. Now, many historians say that it was in this time in the Bastille where Saint-Croix learned much about the art of poisoning. He was imprisoned at the same time as the famous Exili, an Italian in the service of Queen Christina of Sweden, who was an expert on poisons. Exili was imprisoned in the Bastille, not because he had committed a crime, but rather because Louis XIV was suspicious of his presence in France, because the courts of Sweden and France were not on the best of terms at the time. Other historians say that it is highly possible that Saint-Croix was already an acquaintance of Christopher Glazer, a famed Swiss pharmaceutical chemist and professor, and had attended some lectures given by him. Yet, other historians doubt that Saint-Croix came into contact with either and might have just been using their well-established names to sell his poisons for a higher price. Mm, 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 mm. Upon his release from prison, Saint-Croix set himself up as a reformed gentleman. He married, took a house, and began to develop a much quieter reputation as an alchemist and a scholar. However, his affair with Marie Madeleine did not end. Instead, she joined him in his laboratory. Laboratory? Laboratory? I'm not too sure. You get the picture. Saint-Croix started an alchemy business to allow him to work with poisons. He obtained the necessary license to use certain equipment in order to distill them. It was under his tutelage that the Marquise de Brinvilliers started to experiment with poisons and concoct ideas of revenge. Oh, my. Poison was quite the thing in the aristocratic circles, usually used by impatient heirs to speed along their legacies. So concocting poisons was a lucrative business. Saint-Croix had the know-how and Marie-Madeleine the connections amongst her society acquaintances it was possible for the pair to quickly and discreetly find customers. Now let's delve into her crimes. It has been suggested by many researching the Marquise that before poisoning her father, she tested out her poisons on unsuspecting, sick hospital patients. This theory comes from a report made by the Lieutenant General of the Paris Police, Gabriel Nicolas de la Reni, who, in speaking of the Marquise, indicated that she, a pretty and delicate high-born woman from a respectable family, amused herself in observing how different dosages of her poisons took effect in the sick. 
Scholars who support and acknowledge this theory do so because the era in which the Marquis lived enabled the Marquis to get away with murder quite easily. Typical for the era, female members of the French nobility would often visit hospitals to help care for the sick. Because many of these patients were already ill, it provided the means for the Marquise to test out her poisons without much suspicion. She tested out her poisons at the hospital Hôtel Dieu, close to Notre Dame. Furthermore, because Hôtel Dieu was not a very well-managed hospital, as it was overflowing with patients and was more concerned with saving souls than saving lives, deaths, even those under suspicious circumstances, went unnoticed. She also started to experiment on her servants, giving them food tainted with her experimental poisons. Marie-Madeleine's maid, François Roussel, complained that she felt as though her heart was being stabbed after the Marquise fed her poisoned fruit. The Marquise was not tried for these crimes, however, because they were only attributed to her after her execution. In 1666, the Marquise started to slowly poison her father, who would eventually die on the 10th of September. She placed a man by the name of Gascon in her father's household to slowly administer poison to him. In the week before his death, her father invited the Marquise and her children to stay with him. She gave him multiple doses of Glacier's recipe, a tried-and-true mixture of chemicals that would render him dead, seemingly of natural causes. Antoine Drudobré died with the Marquise at his side. An autopsy was performed on his body, which concluded that Drudobré died of natural causes, exacerbated by gout. After the death of her father, the Marquise inherited some of his wealth. She quickly burned through the money and, needing more, decided to poison her two brothers, hoping to get their share of the father's fortune, as she was, to her knowledge, their next heir. Her two brothers lived in the same household, but the Marquise was not on the best of terms with either of them, making them harder to slowly poison than her father. She thus employed a man by the name of Jean Amelin, more commonly known as La Chaussée, to work as a footman in her brother's household. Antoine Dobré, her brother, actually suspected that he was perhaps a target of attempted poison when he noticed that his drink had a metallic taste to it. La Chaussée's attempt at poisoning him there failed, but not long after, during an Easter feast, Antoine fell ill after eating a pie and never recovered, dying on the 17th of June, 1670. The second brother was poisoned soon after, dying in September of the same year. Their subsequent autopsies would hint at poison due to the fact that their intestines were suspiciously colored, but nevertheless concluded that they both died of a malignant humor. I'm not too sure what that means. Now, I read in two places that, <laughs> this is a little bit weird, that they had a sister named Marie-Thérèse. I also read in another um, place that Antoine's widow was also Marie-Thérèse. So I'm kind of confused. But either way, I'm just going to say um, that Antoine's widow, Marie-Thérèse, had her sp suspicions but had no proof of poison. So I'm going with it's the sister-in-law. Although the Marquise tried to also poison her sister, but didn't. <laughs> so I'm not too sure what the story is there. But I'm thinking that the sister-in-law thought, you know what? F this. It's not worth it. And she left. Because sometimes, friends, you got to save your own ass. She's probably thinking to herself, my husband's dead. I can't do anything about it. And I can always remarry. But one thing I can't do is resurrect from the dead. I'm out. <laughs> Marie-Madeleine and Saint-Croix became estranged after the death of her brothers. Then, quite suddenly, in 1672, Saint-Croix died. In debt and without heirs, his possessions were impounded, pending a review by magistrates and his creditors. Discovered amongst them was a small red leather casket. Now, when this box was opened, inside was a note requesting the case and the contents be returned to Madame the Marquise, 
as all that it contains concerns her alone. These contents included incriminating letters from Marie to Saint-Croix. So, upon hearing the news that this box had been found, the Marquise fled France to hide in England. She evaded authorities for a number of years. While in hiding, she survived off of sums of money sent to her by her sister. Now, her sister died in 1674, leaving the Marquise with little money to survive on. She continued to evade capture, moving from place to place every so often. It was in Belgium that the Marquise finally was caught. So in 1676, she rented a room in a convent in Liège, where authorities there recognized her and alerted the French government, who subsequently had her arrested. Among her possessions in the convent was a letter titled, My Confessions which, as the title implies, detailed the various crimes she had committed over the years along with other personal information. In this letter, she admits to having poisoned her father and two brothers and that she had attempted to poison her daughter, her sister, and her husband, although the latter three were unsuccessful. She also confessed to having had many affairs and that three of her children were not her husband's. Some scholars doubt the Marquise's authenticity in her letters, but certainly the content of her confession was heavily used against her in French court. Initially, when questioned, the Marquise heavily feigned ignorance, neither denying or admitting the questions raised against her, but rather pretended that she was not aware of any happenings around her concerning the deaths of her family and her illicit relationship with Saint-Croix. Later in the trial, the Marquise denied all crimes levied against her, placing blame on her former lover, Saint-Croix. This lack of substantial evidence soon changed, however, from the testimony of another of the Marquise's former lovers, Jean-Baptiste Briancourt. Now, Briancourt alleged that not only had the Marquise admitted to him that she poisoned her brothers and father, but that she and Saint-Croix had tried to murder him as well. What in the actual, my friends? What is happening? <laughs> So the Marquise dismissed all of Briancourt's accusations against her, citing that he was a drunkard. She was not believed, however, and after a final interrogation, it was decided that she was guilty of her crimes. She was to be executed by beheading and then have her body burned in a public spectacle. I'm just trying to understand, how can you... It's not even that I'm judging this woman for having lovers. You do what you want in life. But how can you be in like these relationships and then openly say to them, well, you know what? I poisoned my father and my brother like or brothers. When do you have time for all of this? Like I'm someone who has like enormous anxiety. No joke. I wouldn't be able to have any kind of illicit sexual affair with anyone while plotting the death of a whole bunch of other people. Like my mind just does not work like that. I can't. I just, I just can't. As France was a Catholic state at the time of her execution, a confessor was given to the Marquise in her final hours. The man chosen was the Abbé Adem Pirot, a theologian from the Sorbonne. Despite never having ministered a criminal in their final hours, he was nonetheless chosen for the role. He compiled a grand account of her final hours, of which the original copy is housed within the Jesuit library in Paris. Within this recounting, Pirot speaks of her final hours and of her life leading up to her crimes. Before her death, as part of her sentence, the Marquise was subjected to a form of torture known as the water cure, where the subject was made to drink, often through a funnel, copious amounts of water in a short period of time. In his account, Biro noted that when faced with the prospect of torture, the Marquise said she would confess to all. However, she noted that she knew that this would not alleviate her sentence of torture. She added no new information that she had not already confessed under torture, except for adding that she once sold poison to a man who intended to kill his wife. 
After four hours of torture, she entered a final confession session with Pirot in the prison chapel. She was not allowed to take communion before her death due to laws at the time forbidding condemned prisoners to take it. As she left the chapel, a crowd of aristocrats gathered to see the spectacle of her death march as she and the abbe traveled to the Place de Greve for her execution. The marquise was covered in a white slip, as was customary for the condemned at their execution. When they finally reached the Place de Greve, the marquise was unloaded from the cart she was in and brought up to the platform. The executioner shaved her hair before pulling out a sword and chopping off her head. The surrounding area was packed with spectators who hoped to grasp a glimpse of her execution. After the Marquise's execution, authorities, notably La Reine and Louis XIV, were convinced that the Marquise could not have acted alone, and more individuals were involved than Saint Croix. The inquest into the Marquise's accomplices did not stop there. As La Reine explained in a letter, because someone so high-born was involved in such a deadly scandal, it was not a far leap of thought that other members of nobility could be involved in poisonings and other suspicious manners of death. Many people in high positions of power were arrested and tried for murder and other criminal dealings. This gradually expanded until 1679 when the investigations came to their height in the resulting affair known as the Affair of the Poisons, where more than a few hundred individuals were arrested. Notable individuals implicated in the resulting affair include Catherine Mauvoisin, a fortune teller better known as La Voisin, Madame de Montespan, the king's mistress, and Olympia Mancini, the Countess of Soissons. Don't forget to check out episode two because we do delve into L'Affaire des Poisons or the Affair of the Poisons. My, my, my. What an intriguing story that's full of lustful deeds, greedy aristocrats, and of course, murder. It's everything that I thrive on. Let me tell you, you cannot make this shit up. I do hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed talking to you about it. Make sure to tune in on Wednesday for the next episode of Poisonous Affairs. <laughs>